Thank you very, very much for coming out tonight and spending time addressing this. Um, and uh, thank you very much for, for being part of the solution. Um, it's a very, very, very serious problem. And I want to start out talking about an incident just very recently that despite my many years of seeing what I thought was the worst of humanity, was to listen to the tragic story of the Amish children in Lancaster. And I, despite being somebody who, unfortunately, from repeated exposure to the horrors of what happens to children, found it impossible to watch, to listen to, the description of what went on in the schoolhouse. And I think there are several important things that we need to take away from that experience that we can use, hopefully, to protect lots of other kids who are being victimized. And it's a, it is an amazing scene, the contradiction, the paradox between the father who kissed his wife goodbye that morning and took his own kids to school and dropped them off and acted perfectly normal on his way to the schoolhouse where he brought rope, nails, boards, and KY jelly to act out what I think is probably the most evil plot that could be perpetrated on innocent children. And the notion that this man who was in every conceivable way to every outsider who observed him with his children was the ideal family man and nobody who would have been suspected of having the capacity, let alone the desire or the plan or would actually do what he did. He could have passed every psychological test that would have been administered the day before. If he did not kill himself and simply was able to go into the schoolhouse and to shoot a number of kids to molest a number and was able to escape. And it would have simply been the testimony of the kids who lived and survived that ordeal. And he would have been subjected to the test that our legal system our family courts in particular, imposed to find out whether somebody did something or not, he would have gotten off. Because you would have simply had the words of some kids, you would have had all the people saying how nice he was, how the teacher saying he dropped the kids off at school. And uh, he would have passed all the psychological tests, no doubt about it. So that's the first part. These things that we use in our court system, our family court system every day, to figure out the truth in these cases don't work. The second thing about this situation, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I'm so troubled by that event, I, I don't even recall the man's name, was that he talked about having molested 
his nieces when they were much younger. And it's very interesting to see how the media reacted to that because those two girls are now adults and they don't remember, they don't recall being molested by him. And the way the media interpreted that was by saying, well, it must not be true because they don't recall that or, you know, would cast doubt on what he said his, his motive was. When in fact that was simply the act of repression of traumatic events by young kids. It's a phenomenon that occurs all the time. So, hopefully, um, those little girls, um, that something positive will come of, of their plight. I do a lot of training with psychologists, psychiatrists, and I tell them, you know, in custody evaluations, I said, suppose the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal would function as a family court. How would it have been handled? Now, the War Crimes Tribunal, which was put together by the nations of the world after World War II to deal with the Holocaust, heard testimony from witnesses, there were documents, there were pictures, there were films, there were handwriting experts who verified different people's signatures on orders to slaughter people. That's how you determine facts. If it had been in the family court, a psychologist would have been appointed to evaluate the Nazis and the Jews. And the report would have read something like this. The Nazis were well-dressed. They were on time. They were punctual. They were very pleasant. They talked about their kids going to schools and they sang around the tree and sang Christmas carols. And that they talked about, they didn't understand why they were being falsely accused by the Jews because they had built these places for the Jews to live and work. And that they, you know, they couldn't understand the whole situation. They, you know, the Jews had always caused trouble and, you know, they were malicious, etc. And they interviewed the Jews and the Jews were angry, very angry. Oh, said all kind of things about the Nazis. Couldn't even say one nice thing. They were asked, you tell us three things about the Nazis, couldn't come up with one thing. They accused the Nazis of all sorts of unthinkable, horrible things. Didn't want to be with the Nazis. Said, you know, well, why don't we have a meeting where we get you all together and see if we can talk about this, and work this out. No, they didn't want to do that. They were, they were, uh, they were all scattered, they were upset, they were hysterical. So the only conclusion was that this was a case of Nazi alienation syndrome. <laughs> and I do this with psychologists and custody evaluators and there is silence. Because they say that's what we do. That's what we do. You know, we, uh, you, know you give a test, you could have given a psychological test, the MMPI, the Munich Multiphasic Personality Inventory. And there would have been levels of paranoia, you know, they thought the Jews, the Jews said the Nazis were out to get them. You know? And that's what, that's what this whole thing is. You know, the big problem is... The